Today's Columbus Metropolitan, Club, Metropolitan Club Forum, the state budget, we had, we, it's hard to even say the state budget we got, it just doesn't even come out, does it? The state budget we got is sponsored by Ohio Farm Bureau Federation, represented by Adam Sharp and his associates, Hannah News Service, represented by Stephen Mark and Michael Mushrush, and GBQ, represented by Matt Stamp and his associates. Please join me in thanking them today. I'd now like to welcome Matt Stamp from GBQ to introduce today's speakers. Good afternoon, my name is Matt Stamp and I'm the Director of State and Local Taxes for GBQ Partners. Uh, GBQ is proud to sponsor the Columbus Metropolitan Club and today's forum. Uh, information about each of the speakers is in today's flyer, so I'm just gonna give brief introductions here so we can get the, uh, the speaking engagement started. Uh, our first speaker has been the Director of Ohio's Office of Budget and Management since January of 2011, under Governor Kasich. This is the second time he has held the position. Uh, his previous appointment was under Governor Taft. Please welcome Tim Keene. Our next speaker has had a long career in public service, uh, including as Franklin County's uh, recorder and auditor. He began his current uh, position as Ohio's tax commissioner uh, in January of 2011. Please welcome tax commissioner Joe Testa. And then serving as our moderator today is associate professor at the E.W. Scripps School of Journalism at Ohio University. He continues to write about Ohio politics for several Ohio newspapers. Please welcome Tom Suttis. <laughs> Tom, the microphone's all yours. Thank you very much for that very gracious introduction. It's a pleasure to be here today and a privilege as well for a couple of reasons, one of which is that um, independently of whatever political questions may arise. The departments these two other speakers represent, taxation and budget and management, I can say without fear of contradiction, are two of the most professional departments of state government. I speak as someone who dealt with the offices when Governor Rose was in office in the 1970s after he succeeded Governor Gilligan, all through the 80s and 90s and now in the current, uh, current administration as well. And so Obviously, they themselves are appointees of the governor, but their agencies are very, very well run, in my estimation, at the rank and file level. And you can't always say that about every administration and every agency. Two other points I'd like to mention, or three other points I'd like to mention today. The first is that I know that to many, many people, and I know this especially because I teach students about covering public affairs, that budgets and taxation can be not only vexatious, but puzzling to people, and tedious beyond belief. However, the point I hope you will walk away from this uh, get-together, uh, keeping in mind, is this, that no matter what an office holder says, whether he or she is running the U.S. Treasury, the Vatican Bank, the Township Trustees Bank account, whatever an office holder says about what his or her priorities might be, the truth of those priorities is illustrated by the ways in which he or she deploys public money and taxes people. And that is to say that in many, many respects, a budget and a tax package are the actual exemplification of what a politician is actually doing as opposed to what he or she says he or she is doing. That's number one. Number two, many of you in public affairs representation jobs for different um, professions and companies may know this anyway, but I, I make no money off this, by the way. I recommend to you a very, very helpful kind of primer on budgeting in Ohio called Follow the Money, State Budgeting in Ohio by the late Richard Sheridan. This is the third edition. And if you want a very readable step-by-step -step of how Ohio puts together its budget and makes decisions on policy about that budget, this book is for you. And I don't know if it's probably available on Amazon and so forth, but it's very, very helpful. Uh, the third point is that uh, I know, again, these things are dry, but I must confess to something I'm not sure I ever told Director Keene or Commissioner Testa before. I covered budgets so long that during one especially lengthy night when I think Director Keene was working with Mrs. Davidson when she was House Speaker. I was driven so mad, I thought, by the, the tedium of the budget hearing, not the budget itself, I won't recite this to you, I composed a parody of Bob Dylan's immortal song called Rainy Day Women Number 12 and 35, which is to the uh, a take on how they'll cut you when you're trying to be good, they'll cut you just like they said they would and so forth. So that shows you what happens with hanging around budget people too long. You start thinking that you're being bardic about numbers, which doesn't really work. So. 
With that having been said, I'd like to start addressing some questions to these gentlemen, and I will ask one or the other a question, and the other person will be welcomed to jump in. And my first question is for Commissioner Testa. Uh, the the uh, Kasich administration has, I think, rightfully taken credit for a lot of tax cutting in this, uh, in this new budget uh, in all kinds of ways and means. However, this budget also ends, or will end over time, the 12.5% rollback of local property taxes paid by the state taxpayer and also begins to limit, uh, back to what it was, the property tax exemption, homestead exemption for older Ohioans. Could it not be said those are amount to de facto tax increases on Ohio homeowners and property owners? Uh, thanks, Tom. First of all, thank you for the opportunity to, to be here. Uh, the, the last time I was here, right after the executive budget was rolled out, I'd have just a brief comment first. When the executive budget was rolled out, uh, my opening comment, some of you were here, was that I was surprised at how universally loved the tax policy was out of the uh, executive budget. Well, I'm here to tell you I have to slightly modify that comment. Uh, <coughs> I think I overstated it just, just, uh, just a little. Um, uh, yeah, th thanks, Tom. Uh, the 10, 2.5% in the homestead. Um, let me deal with the homestead first. You know, as, as county auditor was mentioned earlier, I was county auditor here in Franklin County for 17 years. So I dealt with homestead exemption on a daily basis. And, and, and as you all know, many of you know, been around for this for a while, that that program is designed to help low-income seniors stay in their homes. I mean, that's what it was designed for back in the 70s. That's the way it was run uh, for all of its life until, until just a few years ago. Um, and of course, that changed. And, uh, why? Because the, because the income threshold that had been there in the, uh, throughout its entire life was, was taken away. So that those of us who earned considerably more than the uh, amounts that were at, at being used at the time was about $26,000, $27,000 a year at the time, um, uh, got, the, got the benefit, which averages close to 500 bucks uh, a parcel uh, across the state uh, today. Uh, a lot of people at the time, myself included, felt that that was inappropriate, but the legislature did what the legislature did, and, and, and so many people applied and got it. Um, and now the change has taken place with this uh, General Assembly and the governor uh, that uh, it goes back to a, a, a means test. $30,000 is the figure that, that we chose, brought it forward from where it was and when it was discontinued to pass, which of course will get a CPI adjustment moving forward as it had in the old days. Much more focused on the original intent, which is of course the, slow, the low, income, low, low income seniors. Everyone who has received it in the past, regardless of their income level, they, they followed the rules, state government said they qualified, they got it, they're going to keep it. They're grandfathered in, they're, they're going to they're keep it. But moving forward, starting with 2014, you turn 65, you own and live in your home, uh, you also have to meet an income threshold, high just gross income of $30,000 or below uh, to continue. We think that is more fair. We think it is more focused on those who really need it the most, the low-income seniors. The 10 2.5% is another, another issue, and these two do link together um, because the state reimburses all of this. Tim knows this uh, better than I, but the, the, the state reimburses all that back to the local jurisdictions. All the homestead exemptions that are gr granted under the, old, on the program, old and new, uh, are reported back to the state. The state then reimburses the locals. So you all pay it. You know, the, the idea that, and the 10, 2.5 percent as well, that's just taken out by the county auditor and reported back to the state. The state writes a check and sends it back to the local. So all of you are paying it through your state taxes, state income taxes, state sales taxes, and so on, because Tim pays it. So, so, the, so the idea that somehow or other people were getting a break um, is a little disguised, I think, because, it, and, and so, so the homestead exemption and the 10, 2.5%, um, and, and for the 10, 2.5%, we're just talk, they're talking about new levies that go on the ballot starting this November moving forward. Again, grandfathered all the existing stuff, because the voters had already made decisions on all those, um, is, more, is more transparent and, uh, and, puts the, and puts it where it belongs, and that is, it was on the real estate tax bill to begin with, was taken off the real estate tax bill and sent to, to the state, and the state reimburses it. So it's really just kind of moving it around, you know, and, and, and this begins to move uh, in that uh, the opposite direction. Uh, and make it a little bit more transparent. I mean, Before Tom, director, Tom, I would just say this, just very quickly. The uh, you said budgets are. How do you allocate your resources? It talks about what your priorities are. Okay, the, one of the things that's been the highlight of the Kasich budget review exercise is how do we raise our revenue, from what sources, and then how do we allocate it? And you know, Ohio, we are a we are a high income tax state. And the governors wanted to state and local combined. Frankly, just state. We have a highly progressive, very high uh, marginal rate. Uh, it's very anti-competitive. Uh, we are a mid-tier property tax state. 
And we also have one of the strongest controls on the growth of property taxes of any state in the union and have for over 80 years. And so to, to, to raise revenue through state taxation, particularly income tax, where we are anti, we're not competitive and we have high marginal rates, to then subsidize property taxes where we are very, very competitive and there's a tremendous control system put in place really doesn't make sense. I mean, the state spends $1.8 billion subsidizing the property tax bills throughout the state. And it's, is that the appropriate place for us to allocate our resources? Our view is no, and we need to take a look at that. Direct, We've done that. Director, this landless peasant, and I have no property of any kind, understands that in many ways you can make the case that you're relieving people like me of a tax burden of sorts. But will this not make it harder for local governments to pass levies? Because the net cost of a taxpayer that owns property will be higher than otherwise? Well, the interesting thing, does it, did it make it easier? Because most people didn't even know it existed particularly the 12 and percent. You could walk down the street and you could talk to the first 10 people you saw and maybe two would know that there was a 12 and percent rollback on owner-occupied property. Homestead exemption, perhaps a slightly different case, but uh, it's not certain to me that there will be a dramatic impact on, on uh, levy passage. Tom, if I may, just two, two things, piggyback on what Tim just said. Uh, making presentations over the last several weeks and since the, since the budget was passed, I've asked that question uh, in, in rooms like this, chambers of commerce, uh, uh, rotary clubs, et cetera, around the state, and I've asked for a show of hands. How many people know that the state ultimately pays 12.5% of your home's real estate tax bill? I see a handful of hands, 10%, 5%. It's tiny. Most people, and these are all educated professional folks, don't know it. So what do you think of, uh, that the average person, I mean, it's just, it's just hidden. Secondly is that on, the, on more on the specific point about making levies more difficult to pass, I've heard that from some of the school folks, and, 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 and here's what it is. The 10, 2.5% rollback is 37 cents per month per mill on a $100,000 house. 37 cents is the difference that it makes per mill on a $100,000 house. Do we make decisions as to whether we're gonna support our levies on that? It might be a factor, and it may be a factor in some people, I suppose. But what about the quality of education? What about the graduation rate? What about the stewardship of the dollars that we've been giving our schools up to that point? Don't they weigh pretty heavily on people's minds when they make levy decisions? I think so. We'll come back to that levy business in a moment, or about school funding in general, but. Back to Director Keene now for a question. Uh, you mentioned uh, earlier, and I would take it as an affirmation of what I said, that budgets are a statement of policy in many ways about what a governor, a mayor, school superintendent wants to do. To that extent, why is it that a budget bill includes, let's just say, it deals with the reproductive rights of women? You know, there are, it, it, Ohio, for a number of years, has used the budget process and the budget bills to address a wide range of policy issues uh, that touch to a greater or lesser degree on resource allocation and program operation issues. And certainly several of the provisions that were in this bill on the subject that you've mentioned do have a budget element to it, allocating resources uh, by the Department of Health for, uh, for certain programs has a budget-related element to it. Now, you know, we can argue about what should be in what bill and the extent to which it is budget-related or not, but it has been the case for a number of years, as you know, uh, that issues of this sort have found their way into the, into the biennial budget bills. Is that a good way to do business in your judgment as a budget expert? The, uh, I mean, if we could talk just about the numbers, that would be fine with me, but I also recognize that it's not, budgets are not just about the numbers. It's about the statutes that uh, establish the programs and their operation. It's about the allocation of those resources. Uh, so there's gonna be statutory changes, codified and uncodified, in, uh, in budget bills, and I am accommodated to that. A question for first for uh, Commissioner Tester, then for Director Keene to follow up on it. Um, um, Governor Vornovich, when he was in office, should talk about how government should do more with less. We should do more and more with less by being more efficient. No argument there, conceptually. Mayors and county commissioners and local officials across the state are saying that de facto, 
what's happening now. I'm not saying they're right. I'm saying this is what they're saying. They're being asked to do less or you have to do more with less, but having less resources because the local government fund is not what it was in terms of um, resources, and because Ohio, for better or for worse, abolished the uh, estate tax, which was admittedly unpredictable for a given jurisdiction, but for many it could be a windfall they could use for special projects and so forth. So are we asking local governments to do more and more and more and yet reducing their state resources, and how is that equitable? The the local jurisdictions um, and, and their perspective and, and uh, what they count on in terms of revenues and that sort of thing, those are obviously localized issues that they are responsible for. Uh, whether, whether a municipality should have in the past counted on certain people to die and leave them a bunch of money, I, I'm not sure that's a good policy. Others can defend it if they wish. Uh, and, 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 and what has happened? What, what, we, what we have seen is that Many jurisdictions have done exactly what we would hope that they would do, and that is to take a real hard look at their expenditure levels and take a look at what programs, policies, and so on that they have had in place in the past that could possibly augment or modify or reduce or whatever uh, to, 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 live within, to, to live within their means. Um, some have, uh, have gone back and asked the voters for additional monies. In some cases, they've been approved. some cases, they haven't. But we, I think what we need to do is we need to look at the overall, overall situation. Um, it, is, it, is a, it, is a, it is a partnership in, sen in a sense, <coughs> excuse me, because the state subsidizes the locals dramatically from state taxes. We, Tim just mentioned one um, from the 10.2.5% from the rollback in Homestead so, and many others that I'm sure that he could, they could cite to. So is it just the state government stands in isolation over here and, and balances its, bu its budget, has no impact on the locals? Of course not. But what the locals do, too, has an impact on the state. Why? <coughs> because we make disincentives for business growth. L local jurisdictions that make it more difficult, either by onerous tax or regulations or processes, procedures, uh, so on, make it more difficult for businesses to grow, or to, to move to Ohio, to expand within Ohio. Does that affect the state revenues? Of course it does, as it does the locals as well. So the, the idea that it it's in, you know, should be over there in isolation, you state you fix your problems, locals you go to fix your problems, I don't think it's very realistic. Um, because we do impact one another. Local jurisdictions, and I hear this all the time about local policies and, and tax levels and so on having a negative impact <clears throat> on business growth, and uh, that, of course, is going to affect the state as well. So it needs to be, we need to look at it more holistically, and, and uh, we need to, we need to, to uh, reflect in, in, in state policy and legislation, but also local ordinance and local jurisdictions as well. Uh, how can we make this a more business and tax fr taxpayer friendly state? And, and the aggregate. Uh, that's really the challenge, I think. Well, and I would just mention that in the State General Revenue Fund, over 85 percent of the State General Revenue Fund is distributed to schools, local governments, and other entities that serve Ohioans in their community. So much of what the state government, much of the revenue that the state government raises through taxation finds, it, finds its way right back into uh, local communities. Uh, the, uh, the local government fund, of which there's been much attention, is just one small source of the state revenue that is distributed to the locals. In this budget, there's going to be uh, 13, over $13.5 billion of state money that is distributed to schools and local governments uh, in this fiscal year, and it'll approach, it'll be $14 billion next. The local government fund is $350 million. Beyond that, I would just say that local government revenue uh, Clearly, the, the, the national economy had great impacts on government at all levels. Uh, but local, total local revenue is growing and has grown over $2 billion in the period of time that the governor's been in office. Uh, and again, th there, that's over $50 billion in total local and school revenue in this state, of which the local government fund is now $350 million. So it's a very, there's been a lot of focus on it but it is a very small fraction of the total amount of aid that the state provides to schools and local governments, and it is an even much smaller fraction of the total resources that are available to schools and local governments to provide the, the services to Ohio's citizens. Speaking of the local governments and local localities getting state aid, uh, and understanding that I not disagree or agree with this number, I haven't checked it, there are critics, and of course there's an election coming up, as you gentlemen and others in this room know, there are critics that say that um, although the governor and this budget uh, do quite a bit in terms of restoring uh, losses to public school funding that were based on the, the losses of the past, 
and I haven't done the math on this, that one claim was made that uh, uh, in the aggregate uh, state aid to public schools, K through 12 and so forth, is only about one percentage point greater than it was in fiscal 09. Now, I'm not as even assuming that's correct. Um, what does that say about what happened during the last few years that we've lost, they have, have they not got something to make up for in terms of what they did not get during those years? Well, the whole, I mean, look, the, the national economy has something to make up for. I mean, we have been through a tremendous economic uh, challenge here. I mean, this is the, we had the most severe economic downturn since the Great Depression. We have been enduring the slowest economic expansion in the post-World War II era. So I would expect that governments, state, local, school district, uh, would probably feel the same impacts that the larger economy does. For, local, for governments to think that they are somehow exempt from the economy, the impacts, the general effects of the economy, uh, I think is unrealistic. Uh, I, I tell you, the fact, that, the fact that in the Casey administration, there is more money going to schools, school districts, from the state than when the governor came into office, uh, frankly, reflects the fact that it is a priority of the governor to try to focus significant resources to the schools. This question is for uh, Commissioner Testa. Uh, obviously, Commissioner, you and the governor and others worked very hard in an attempt to get the legislature to enact uh, what I think is correctly called a reform of the severance tax uh, regime in this state, which anyone who researches it, and we've done this as part of our newspaper work, uh, Ohio's severance tax levels, and you may disagree if you're not one of those industries, is laughably low, almost insultingly low, given the profits that the petrochemical industries make off those resources and others. Can you give us some analysis in your mind of why that was, um, again, the administration was for it and worked hard for it, why that didn't get done politically? No. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to talk about the politics of it. Uh, I used to be a politician. I, I, well, I, you know, I, I, I had to deal with that. No, I'm sorry. What's the John. philosophical view? Uh, okay. Uh, um, I can't answer specifically as to why the legislature did not move on or why they decided to set it aside. Um, uh, clearly, uh, you've already said it, but clearly we feel this is absolutely the right thing to do. Uh, we are the lowest in the country, and, uh, and, and our goal here, the governor's goal, and our goal is, is this is not, our attempt is not to grow government. It's not to grow government. It's to reduce the personal income tax rates. Tim has already stated it, and, and I'll, I'll repeat it again. We're, 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 we're too high. We're, it's an economic disadvantage, the, per, the personal income tax level in this, in this state. We top out with, before this change at 9.825% in some jurisdictions in this state. State, municipal, and school district income tax on top of it, it's, it's ridiculous. Even with the 10% cut that we did manage to get through this in this budget, takes us down to like 9.3, 9.4, something like that. I mean, it's still way, 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 way too high in the, in the aggregate. So that's what the goal was, and, and, we, and we're still committed to it. We think it's the right thing to do. We think we're the lowest. We are the lowest, not just think we are. We are the lowest in the country. Uh, our proposal would still keep us the lowest in the country on gas, about the fifth lowest in, in the country on, on oil, um, and, uh, and not be a disincentive. I, quite frankly, uh, Tom, there's some of the comments that, that, that have been made to us that people are going to pick up their rigs and take them someplace else to drill where there is no oil because <laughs> the taxes are lower is, 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 is nonsensical. Uh, it is here. The commodity is here. It's valuable. They're doing an extremely good. Yes, it is expensive to drill, and, and we put in a cost recovery piece into our proposal as well. So we think we're treating the oil and gas industry fairly in our, in our proposal. Why it didn't get through the legislature, I can't, really, I can't really speak to that, but it certainly should, and uh, we have not given up. Um, this uh, question is for Director Keene. Um, one of the things that you have jurisdiction over and, and steward is our savings account, so to speak, our rainy day fund, and also our debt rating, um, uh, our bonds and our cost of money doing business in Wall Street by selling bonds. Uh, can you give us a, a brief thumbnail of where things stand with the rainy day fund and with our bond ratings? I can, Tom. The, we have, Governor Kasich has uh, focused very closely on our steward, fiscal stewardship of the, of our resources. Uh, we have, and he has insisted that we use conservative economics and conservative restu revenue estimating when we put together our budgets. Uh, he has insisted that we carefully budget, and uh, in, we budget for the expenses we expect, and we budget conservatively. 
As a result of that, at the end of each of the three years that he's been in office, we've been able to make deposits into our budget stabilization fund. And just last month, we were able to make a deposit to our budget stabilization fund of approaching $1 billion, which, put, which puts our rainy day fund at $1.48 billion, which is a large amount of money. But it is 5% of our state general revenue fund spending, which is the statutory target for the, for the budget stabilization fund. So we are, uh, beyond that, we were able to use some of the resources to help jumpstart our tax cut program, uh, personal income tax reductions, which are in this budget bill. Those rebuilding, and again, when the governor came into office, the rainy day fund, as you've heard him say many times, was 89 cents. So uh, we have rebuilt our financial cushion, which helps us, uh, frankly, deal with the uncertainties that may arise, and not just the state, but also the locals given the fact that I mentioned that all those resources that we distribute out to the locals, if we have a cushion of this nature, it is good for the schools, it's good for the local governments, because if we run into unforeseen circumstances, we can re reasonably and prudently develop a plan to get ourselves back to fiscal, fiscal stability. The state bond rating for our general obligation bonds is AA plus or AA1, which is the second highest that is possible. Again, when the governor came into office, we were on a negative outlook from a couple of the rating agencies, which meant that their view was that their next potential rating move would be to downgrade the state. Uh, again, because of some of the work we did to stabilize the finances, those uh, negative outlooks were removed, and we're, we are now stable in outlook at AA+, uh, that has been affirmed when we've recently been out to, to sell bonds, which, again, the state periodically does. We, we issue debt not for operating purposes, because we have a balanced budget, we our in-year revenues cover our in-year expenses, but we issue long-term obligation bonds to fund capital improvements to build schools, colleges and university facilities, uh, uh, state prisons and other state facilities. And that bond rating agency helps us get money at the uh, lowest possible cost, which again, then saves the operating budget since our debt service payments are lower uh, in future years. Commissioner Testa, you have been a local government official and very successfully now you're in the cabinet. And your department, as I mentioned, has got some really very skilled people in it, including some really good research people on tax policy. Uh, based on your experience and what you know, is it your take, there's a constant debate on Ohio's perceived tax climate. And everyone has a point of view about it, business people, uh, social welfare people and others. If, if it's not unfair to bifurcate it this way, do you think the, the difficulty is more in the state tax burden or the local tax burden? Or maybe both combined. What's your take on that? Uh, it's, uh, thanks. And, and it, it does speak to a comment that I made earlier. There is, there is a combination element here as well. Um, we have made some, some great moves, and, 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 and even going back to 2005 with tax reform then, uh, several positive things happened. Corporate franchise tax, tangible personal property tax, uh, some things that make this state more competitive and, and so on. So, so there are good things and personal income tax reductions that were in that bill as well. Um, so it certainly has helped uh, the state uh, as, as, a, as a whole. So the tax climate, I think, in Ohio from the state level, I think has certainly improved. Um, we still have one big sore thumb, and that is personal income tax rate, which I've already mentioned we're going to try to continue to work on. Clearly, we want to continue to work on. We think it's anti-competitive. Um, but they, they, we have a very, very complex state when it comes to state and local tax, probably the most complex in the country. Uh, municipalities, school districts, I mean, there are so many taxing entities at the local levels in the state, it makes it very, very difficult, very expensive for businesses. I hear those comments, complaints all, all the time. So, um, and, it's, and it's difficult because, you know, there's home rule, there's, there's you know, local jurisdiction responsibilities uh, to deal with their own issues. And I was a local government. I was in the county government for a long time, and I respect that. But also we recognize that, um, that uh, with uh, the, the you know, hundreds of, of individual entities that have taxing authority that, that tax in different ways, again, municipalities and schools, uh, social service agencies through the levy uh, efforts and that kind of thing, makes it very, 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 very complex and, and expensive for businesses to, to transact business and, and, and to grow. So it is a disincentive. Um, so there's a lot of work that needs to be done, I think, uh, to, to try to try to bring some uniformity, try to bring some greater consistency, try to make it easier for businesses to be able to comply, particularly businesses, to comply with uh, the, the, the myriad of, of, uh, of tax laws, uh, particularly at the local level. So I think the tax climate has improved. Uh, certainly we've pointed to some certain, certain things, but we have a long way to go. 
you know, just for point of information, the last year for which comparable and complete information is available would be calendar year 11 for locals, fiscal year 11 for the state. The state collected about $25 billion in taxes from all sources and, and not just the general fund. Local governments collected about $22 billion in taxes. I don't think it's generally understood how much tax revenue is raised across this state by local governments and schools. And so whenever we have a conversation about taxation and the impact on the economy, you know, you have to consider those local government, ta the local government taxes. And as Joe said, unlike, you know, the, they, we have the most uh, local add-on income taxes of any state in the uh, in the country, and we have piggyback sales taxes. Uh, we have all we have a variety of different local government jurisdictions that are levying property taxes, and that's got to be taken into consideration as we think about what are the economic what impact does taxation have on economic growth and economic competitiveness. The other day, many people in this room would have seen an article in the Wall Street Journal that, uh, in my words, not the Wall Street Journal's words, uh, portray the governor. Uh, I'm not being sarcastic. I'm just saying using shorthand as a kinder, gentler Republican than some others in the country might be. And in one of the arguments in that direction is the governor's quest um, for the expansion of Medicaid to people with a certain level of uh, the, the poverty level and so forth. Uh, Director, what do you see right now as the prospects for getting that done this calendar year, well, Medicaid expansion? Tom, Tom, as you know, the, the, the Medicaid expansion, the provisions of the ACA kick in on January 1. And so that, the reason that the governor advanced, after careful consideration, he advanced this element as part of the budget was because we need to have some time to prepare to be ready for January 1, 2014. Uh, we have worked very hard to try to persuade the legislature that this is the right course of action. They were unprepared to do that in the budget bill. They have uh, committed to continue to work on this as a separate piece of legislation. There is work going on this summer, I know. There, there are hearings to continue to talk about how to move forward. The administration continues to aggressively advocate for an expansion uh, it, 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 through, through legislative action. And we will continue to work with the legislature to do just that. Uh, I am hopeful that there will be action when the legislature returns after Labor Day. And uh, I, I feel like there is a, like, a strong likelihood that there will be action uh, before the end of the calendar year. So I could say that you're optimistic rather than pessimistic? You can. Thank you, I will. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Director, for that. I appreciate that very much. Uh, one of the perennials, and maybe someone in the audience will have a question about this too, and I know that uh, I've known Director Keene, especially going back a number of years from his days in legislative staff, is, um, but this is really a question for D Commissioner Testa as well is uh, one of the things that you must have heard at public meetings when you've done all these meetings all these years with taxpayers, especially when you were a Franklin County official, is the claim, or the, not the claim, but the reverberation of the state Supreme Court's argument that Ohio is overly dependent on the property tax for the education of young men and women in grades K through 12. Now, without getting into the merits of that argument or demerits of it or not, um, is there a better way for us to handle property taxation in terms of school funding than we're doing right now in terms of either the scope of it or whether there should be a contribution or some kind of pooling or what, what is that you must have thought about this because of your work. Is there a better way for us to do this than we're doing it right now? Part of that I can answer, Tom. I mean, in terms of a, a better way uh, to, to, to fund schools, uh, to in more consistency or some people's view, greater consistency with Durell, um, is maybe not an issue I can, I can address directly. But as county auditor, uh, what I did deal with was, and it takes me back to the previous question, that is the complexity of it. At the local level, um, as county auditor, of course, you're dealing with all the, all the real estate uh, tax levies, much of which is schools. Others, of course, go to social service agencies and, 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 and others. Uh, is the complexity of it and the difficulty of understanding what it is that they're being asked to vote for. Um, uh, you know, can, uh, for uh, for various tax levies, uh, new and renewals and replacements, and and uh, the the dozens of uh, variations uh, on that theme. So that's to me, th and that's always been something that that, that uh, as county auditor and and uh, I try to address even since then, um, is that it's something that Ohio really needs to address. 
um, because I'm, I'm really a fan of clarity at the ballot. If, if, if you go into, the, go into the voting booth on election day and you're being asked to raise your own taxes for some particular purpose, it ought to be really clear what that's all about. And I think it's very, very difficult for, for voters to un, unravel that. As county auditor, I spent a lot of time, uh, a lot of time on our websites and various things that we did trying to help people understand what the impact of that vote would be in terms of their own pocket. Um, but, uh, and, and I think we made some progress in that, in that area. But that is extremely com complex uh, area. How it has gotten that crazy, I, I, I don't know. It's happened over many, many decades. But that would be a focus, I think, uh, to, so that people at least know what they're voting for. If, and, and I, I, you know, again, this, this is a voter's decision. If the voters actually know that this is what this decision means to me and my, my tax bill, and they say, yes, I like what my schools are doing. I'm willing to give them more money. I like what Children's Services or Adam or MRDD or whoever it is is doing. I want to give them more money. Great. Wonderful. It's democracy. People get to vote, and, that, and, that, and that's fine. My problem is the complexity of the whole process, not understanding the impact of the decisions that they're being asked to make. Would a single statewide uniform property tax be the answer? It might reduce the rate for many, many people. Would do, I'm sorry, would do what? We, we might reduce the rate for many, many people. Yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, obviously um, for lower taxes in all possible areas. So <laughs> if it reduces the rate, I'll be happy with that. Uh, but uh, uh, obviously, it's very problematic, just as we have found in, in, in other areas, uh, because n nobody wants to give up their local control of that. And I, and, and I respect and, and, and understand that. Uh, in terms of the simplification aspect of it, yes, of course it would be, it would be better uh, in, in that respect. But again, is that possible? Um, again, and, 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 and how do we feel as, as, as citizens? You know, shouldn't I, as an individual property owner, be able to go and decide that I want the kids in my school district to have, have the latest computers, uh, a new buildings, uh, you know, the latest in technology, or whatever it might be? Yeah, I should be able to do that. So there should always be some kind of a balance, it would seem to me. Uh, so totally wiping it out, if that's the gist of your question, to take away local, the individual property owners and voters to be able to go to the ballot and, and make those decisions on a local level, I, I don't think that, that's, that's realistic. Um, and I'm not sure that it's the correct thing to do either, because I think I ought to be able to make that decision at a local level. And so, so there is this dichotomy. Um, it, it, could we simplify this? Could we change the structure so that there is um, a, a, a greater balance between the two at a statewide level, and then, and then also having some room for, for local, uh, locals to be able to go to the voters and ask for additional monies? Maybe, maybe something like, like that could be done. Uh, I don't see how you could ever possibly, and I'm not sure that it would be the right thing to do to get away from it entirely. My last question for, for either one of you, but first for Director Keene, is, um, uh, Director, traditionally we have this euphemistic thing in Ohio in the legislature called a budget corrective bill, which is kind of an interesting way of putting it. <coughs> and I presume you have a list of unfinished business you'd like to address, and we do have such a bill probably either late this year or early next calendar year. Uh, can you tell us what one or two of the items that are highest on your list for taking to the legislature saying we must correct this problem by addressing it this way? Well, as you know, uh, Tom, in the Casey administration, we have dispensed with corrective bills, and we have introduced the mid-biennium review in, the, in yes, its place. Yes, we call them different things. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> as the late Roger Tracy once said, sometimes we must rise above principle. <laughs> And so, you know, in, in, the, in the first biennium, we had a very comprehensive mid-biennium review where we took a lot, we reviewed what we had enacted and we uh, engaged in what we thought was a mid-biennium conference review of agencies, operations, programs. Uh, and of course, some of the traditional corrective items would find their way, uh, found their way into that piece of legislation. The, uh, frankly, I don't really, ha I don't have a corrective list per se. Uh, at this time. OBM is beginning to plan for the upcoming mid-biennium review, which will uh, make its way into the public view next calendar year. Thank you so much, um, Commissioner Testa and uh, Director Keene. Uh, it's um, it's uh, the Metropolitan Club, Club's tradition to take audience questions. Um, uh, CMC Films, all of its forums for broadcast on Columbus TV, the public Ohio channel, and viewing on YouTube with a link on CMC's website. If you have a question, please go to the microphone and introduce yourself. Yes, hi, Andy Campbell. I appreciate your being here today, gentlemen. Um, one of the things I thought was particularly impressive was how the uh, state handled the uh, Ohio Turnpike. 
uh, rather than selling that to a private entity, leveraging that as an asset. Could you fill us in a little bit about it, the thinking behind that and how that works for the state of Ohio? Sure. The, the administration conducted a year-long process to review how we might take maximum advantage for the state of Ohio of the asset that is the Ohio Turnpike. Uh, the Ohio Turnpike, uh, I mean, just, just stepping back, we have, for, for many years, Ohio has overpromised major highway construction projects that, are, that have significant imp uh, importance and impact on our, uh, on our economy, a manufacturing and logistics-based economy. Uh, so there are projects that just cannot be funded. The governor was not inclined to uh, increase the gas tax. We knew we had the asset of the turnpike. We wanted to undertake a comprehensive review. There were a number of different options. Might we, might we uh, engage in a long-term lease with a private enterprise? Might we uh, just issue existing bonds as the turnpike existed? Might we undertake some kind of a hybrid? We took a careful long-term review as to what we thought was the way to balance a lot of the uh, competing interests. You know, to what, what is in a, how do we maintain the turnpike in the condition that it's in and improve its condition over time? How do we ensure that the uh, tolls that are charged are reasonable and appropriate over time? Uh, how do we make sure, how can we maximize the revenue that we could raise? After that long review, a decision was made to go with the program which the governor advanced or in this budget package to uh, set up, a, to make some changes to the turnpike law, to uh, change the turnpike commission to the turnpike and infrastructure, infrastructure commission, to set up a mechanism whereby we would very modestly increase the tolls for over the next 10 years at a level of at inflation, which is essentially less than the tolls have gone up over the past 20 years, uh, in order to generate revenue that could support some additional long-term bond issuances that could then be used for projects that have a nexus or relationship with the turnpike, which will predominantly be in northern Ohio, uh, but that in fact will then free up some other state resources and draw down some federal resources that will allow us to conduct a, uh, a pretty aggressive construction and major renovation program in uh, addressing some of these uh, significant highway projects that have been promised and identified as important but really can't be funded at this time. And so that's the, that's the process we went through. Uh, we presented that to the legislature. It was, uh, it was generally enacted as we had put it in place. In fact, we uh, sold bonds a couple weeks ago. Uh, we had a billion dollar bond sale. So the, and in fact, I'm told that yesterday that the state, the Turnpike Commission received the resources. From this point on, the uh, Department of Transportation will present projects to the Turnpike Commission who will then uh, assess them and if they are consistent with the, the statutory requirements for these projects will be approved by the Turnpike Commission and, and will start to get underway on some of these major, major projects. Yes, ma'am. Next question. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, Laura Kaprowski with the Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission. Um, the last budget had a lot of interesting and new initiatives and programs related to shared services, collaboration. So just curious about feelings, reactions as to how that's gone forward and also in relation to this budget. Are there any highlights, anything in particular new or um, carrying on in that realm of shared services? Well, there are, there are a number of shared services activities that are happening throughout this state. Uh, one of the, uh, there's a local government innovation fund which was included in the last budget which continues to be funded in this budget that has grants and loans that are available to, uh, ex for local governments to come together and implement shared services solutions or perhaps to study them. Uh, we had a number of provisions that allowed local entities to work together with each other in order to come together and provide lower cost, better service solutions to local governments. I mean, I know we, the administration continues to talk a lot about shared services to call, atten to call attention to these opportunities, uh, but, uh, it, and, but there's, a lot of, there's a lot happening. There's a lot going on uh, in that area. Uh, there, there was a, a fair amount going on before uh, the Kasich administration came into office. 
Uh, I think it's accelerating, however, at this point. I mean, one of the major projects that the state is involved in is the uh, multi-agency radio communication system. And this was something that we uh, funded in the last capital bill, whereby the state, ha who, the state has a, a, this MARC system, which we use for state communications. And we are now opening it up to the local governments. So that local governments, when it comes time for them to replace their police or fire radio communication systems, and, and they can avoid that capital cost, they can join for uh, a, what I think are very modest fees that are intended solely to cover the, uh, the operating costs of the system, they can join this statewide, uh, state-of-the-art communication system that provides for interagency communication uh, that I, I think makes, a, I think from a public safety standpoint, it's the right thing to do, and from a state government or from a local government efficiency and operational standpoint, it's the right thing to do. And so we're out there trying to talk a lot about that. And again, we're getting more and more folks, uh, jurisdictions coming on uh, every month. We have time for about one real fast question and one real fast answer. Yes, ma'am. Great. Uh, Jane Scott with the Metropolitan Club. Thank you again for being here. Um, <clears throat> in, a, in your perfect world, Governor Kasich gets reelected and you're four years down the road. Uh, what are some of the fiscal and monetary policies and things that you would like to get accomplished in the next four years and, and maybe looking at a budget for the last two years of the Kasich uh, administration? You want to start? Uh, Jane, thanks. Uh, uh, I've already stated uh, you know, our, our goals, uh, and let me talk about tax. On, on the tax side, our goals clearly are to, to make Ohio more tax competitive by continuing to drive down personal income tax rates. One of the things we did not talk about today was on the business side. Uh, the small business tax cut, we were very, very proud of that. We were very glad that got through the legislature. Uh, the 50% reduction for pass-through entities, uh, S-Corps, LLCs, uh, sole proprietorships, et cetera. Um, the governor is real big on, on small business. He focuses on recognizes that their ability. So the more that we can do along those lines, uh, I think that's, that's clearly going to be continue to be our goal. Personal income tax for all Ohioans, obviously, is a major goal for us to drive that down as far as we possibly can. Maybe not eliminated by 2015, but, but we're on that. We'll, we'll see what we can do. Uh, and, then, and then beyond that is, again, trying to bring, bring uh, greater sim simplicity. Uh, I'm a big fan of trying to find simplification in the tax code, and, and, and there's so much complexity. We've already touched on several th here today uh, that we really need to work on. So, so the goals I'm, I'm doing from the tax department are, are primarily those finding efficiencies, reducing, reducing our impact, um, and, uh, and, and trying to make this simpler and more business tax, tax friendly as best we possibly can, redu reducing our personal income tax rates. With that, I'm going to return the microphone back to Tom, and we can ask Tim afterwards what, his, what the top of his Christmas list is. Thank you. I hope everyone enjoyed the forum today. Remember that you can see it again and share it via a YouTube link on CMC's website. We encourage you to continue the conversation in the lobby over coffee and cookies. If you'd like to be added to our email blast, just put your business card in the plastic sleeve of your name badge before you drop it in the basket. If you've not done so, please fill out the survey at your table and drop it in the basket with your name badge. Please be sure to make your reservations for the next forum as well. Once more, we want to thank our sponsors, the Ohio Farm Bureau, Hannah News Service, and our friends with GBQ Partners. Let's also thank our speakers, Director Tim Keene, Commissioner Testa, and Tom Suttis. Thank you for being here. Have a good afternoon. Great job.